Alrighty, so in this video, what I'm going to do is look at where we derive the SUVAT equations from, and then we'll have a look at some of the principles that are involved in the process of freefall. Um, so let's start it as usual with a couple of key definitions. So, what I'm what do I mean by freefall? So I mean a uh, we're looking at the motion of an object in which gravity is the only force acting. So, I don't know, if you're a parachute jumper and you jump out of a plane, initially at least, you are under free fall, not so much later on, as we all look. Um, but that's what we're talking about. The other thing, when we're talking about air resistance in various problems, what we're talking about is the force acting against the motion of object. Resistance always acts against the motion. And it's the, resi the force from collisions with air particles. So there are other forces like friction for instance which act against motion but air resistance is specifically due to the collision with air particles. Now the key thing to remember with SUVAT equations is once we've got them and you want to start using them you can only use them in places where acceleration is uniform or acceleration is constant. So most people actually use SUVAT equations fine but the most common mistake I see is actually applying SUVAT equations where you aren't supposed to and getting the wrong answer because um, assuming acceleration is constant is not appropriate, so look out for that one. Okay, so let's look at the symbols that we're going to use. So this is where why they're called the SUVAT equations, because these are the five properties involved in them. S, your displacement. U, your initial velocity. V, your final velocity. A, your acceleration, which in free fall will be G. And um, then T is the like, change in time, so the time over which something has occurred. Okay, so what we do is we want to actually derive some equations that link these properties together. And we're going to get the first two by looking at a velocity time graph. Okay, so what we're trying to get first of all is this one. So this is the first SUVAT equation, and it's probably the simplest one. V equals U plus 80, or final speed is initial speed plus acceleration times time. So... Here's a velocity time graph where the velocity is changing. We can see it's a straight line graph, which means acceleration is constant, so which is a condition for SUVAT, so that's all good. Um, so what we're actually going to do is take a look at how we can get to this equation here. So, and the way we do that is by generating an expression for the acceleration. So, you should know already is acceleration is the gradient of um, a velocity time graph. So, acceleration is your change in your velocity over the time in which it occurs. So, in this case, the change in velocity is going to be the final minus initial. That's what change always is. And t is the time over which that's occurred. So what we do is we take t to the other side, we take u to the other side, and you end up with v equals u plus a t. And so what we've got there is our first SUVAT equation. So let's put a red box around it because it's one you're going to be using. Okay, so uh, then what we're going to try to do is get this second SUVAT equation here. And we're going to do it. Um, by looking at the area under the graph. So you should know that the area under a velocity time graph is the displacement. So the area under the graph is all of this. So if you don't know, the way to calculate the area of a trapezium is the average of the two sides. So the average of this and this which will be u plus v over 2, that's the average of those two sides, times by the base, which is t. And what we've got there is this equation here. So you're just using the principle that acceleration is the gradient of a velocity time graph, we've got one equation, and just using the fact that displacement's the area under a velocity time graph, we've managed to get another equation here. Okay, so let's move on to the next two. And essentially, what we are going to be doing is making some substitutions, essentially. Okay, so the third equation you typically come across is this one right here. 
So what we're going to start off with, we're going to have our two equations, and we also had times t. So what we're going to do is we're going to substitute v in for into the s equation. So we've got the displacement s is u plus u plus a t all over two times by t. Let's clean that up. So we end up with 2u plus a t all over 2. And that's all multiplied by t. So we can clean that up even more. S is going to be ut, because in the left-hand side, the 2 is going to cancel. But on the other side, you end up with a t squared. And we've got this equation right here. And the other thing we can do is we can rearrange the first equation to make t the subject. So v minus u over a is equal to t. And we can substitute that in. So we get displacement is u plus v minus u times by um, what we've got all oh, that's all over 2a so we've ended up with this expression so we get 2a s is equal to v squared minus u squared and then we get when we rearrange that u squared plus 2a s and there we have it essentially we've got this equation. Now there is actually a fifth one, um, but I'll leave you to try and figure out that one is you or you have a look up online. But these are the four you'll get in a form your formula sheet and the four you classically use, but there is one more, but I'll leave that up to you to find out. Okay, so those are the four SUVAT equations, uh, which you'll be putting to use uh, quite a lot through the mechanics module. But in order to discuss free fall and the motion of things once you drop them, I want to introduce you to a bit more detail on air resistance. So I just wanted to clarify here, this air resistance stuff is not, or the, the equation part of it anyway, is not part of the specification. You need to be able to descriptively know what happens with air resistance, but I think it's very useful to actually understand how air resistance works, because then you can start to see how the motion changes, etc. So you can actually calculate air resistance by knowing a few things. Um, so if you know the density of air, uh, and you know the velocity of the object, and you know the frontal area of the object, and you know something called the drag coefficient, which is not something to worry about at all, you can actually work out what the air resistance something will experience is. So what is this drag coefficient? Um, it's essentially of how difficult it is to move through a certain fluid. It's a constant, so it's really not something we need to worry about. What we're mostly interested in is these two on the right-hand side, the area and the V squared. So frontal area. So let's say we've got this object here, and it's traveling that way. So the frontal area will therefore be a square which corresponds to that, because that is what is going through the air. The sides aren't really encountering any air particles blocking their path. It's just this frontal area that is. Um, so it's, this is what this A is. So if you can reduce something's frontal area, as you can see from the equation, the air resistance will be reduced. And the other thing you can do to change air resistance is actually change the velocity. So objects moving faster, because V squared actually experiences a very large air resistance, which is why it's very hard to go very quickly through air, and that will start to come into play once you're reaching very high speeds when you're a parachutist, for example. So, like I said, not necessarily important to know this in great detail, but it's very useful to understand the relationship between air resistance and area and velocity. Okay. That concludes this video. The next one's going to be looking at how we can apply SUVAT in two dimensions, but let's get one dimension right first.